decided that we would um, share this lecture and we were just going to split it to ensure that we don't cover the same um, topic as part of today's theme. So I'll go first and then Zaina will fall in afterwards and if there's anything we've missed then we'll just sort of add it in as we go. Okay. So what we're going to focus on today is really talking about some principles of ethics and what I'll be doing is discussing something that you should be very familiar with but we'll talk about it again recapping that information but we'll also highlight how it applies to genetics specifically because sometimes that may be quite different to how we apply it to our medical or usual medical practice um, for the purpose that Zona will pick up on this information again for the purpose that genetic information is completely different um, to normal medical information for various reasons and she'll go into detail of, uh, with that for you guys. Okay, so then um, once we've discussed these principles, we'll just, I've highlighted three cases which I thought we can start as a real basic um, indication of how we apply these principles to somewhat tricky situations. And then later on in the next coming modules, we'll maybe focus a bit more on specific details, talking about the ethics really behind predictive testing, the ethics behind, you know, finding incidental findings and so forth. Okay. So the four principles that you should really be familiar with, okay, hopefully you do know a lot about, um, are the things that we would go to or think about if we're faced with a difficult situation or if we're faced with a, uh, a choice where we have to base our choice on ethical principles. All right, so what do you recall in terms of your medical practice um, with regards to autonomy? So very basically, describe to me how you would ensure autonomy for a patient, or what is autonomy for them? Their own personality, their own rights. Exactly. So they have a right to make a choice, basically. Okay. So the capacity to act intentionally with understanding and without controlling influences. But now, to be able to make that choice informed and without being forced into a particular situation, we obviously need to ensure consent, informed consent. So if we apply this autonomous situation to genetics, the importance of informed consent lies in the fact that they know why they're doing the genetic test and they know what type of information will come from that and they're not forced into it. Okay, so if we're thinking of a particular test, they need to know, is this um, predictive? Is this diagnostic? Is this prenatal? Is this carrier testing? And if it's carrier testing, you know, is it recessive or is it X-linked? Because those all have very different implications, although those tests are done in exactly the same way in the laboratory. Um, we need to make sure that they weren't forced into that decision to have testing by a family member who's very anxious about finding a diagnosis in their child and this is, you know, some information that needs to be supported to get further um, insight into that condition. We need to make sure it's at the right time for them to undergo testing. Are they faced with other pressures? Perhaps there's a different, better time for them to be discussing genetic testing and so forth. What are the chances of coming up with a positive result? You know, is this condition um, something where a sequencing or MLPA or deletion duplication studies is going to give you 100% detection rate or only 70%? And is there a definite yes or no answer or is there an answer that is not going to be as clear to interpret? And will it change their management? Won't it change their management? Okay, so be able to ensure informed consent, a discussion of all of those topics needs to incur so that they can make an autonomous choice. And that is where our consent forms come in. So any genetic test should always be done in the presence of a signed consent form and a thorough discussion of this type of information as it applies to that particular disorder. Okay. So the second one, what do we understand by non-maleficence? No mm -hmm. Okay, and that harm can be as a result of intentional or negligence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think most of the time we can, it can go without saying that we're not going to intentionally do harm to our patients. And we can recognise the fact where there's intentional harm. But the one that is as a result of negligence may be something that we face with a little bit more commonly in our practice. 
Okay, so the legal criteria for determining this is based on a number of factors and that includes the duty to the affected party, the professional must breach that particular duty that they have, they must affect harm uh, or experience harm as a result of the affected party and the harm must be caused by the breach of that duty. So if harm occurs as a result of one of these four factors, then that individual can be found negligent. Okay. Now how do we apply that to genetics? Well, the one thing that we need to consider here is that who should be informed about this information? And to prevent non maleficence we should not inform third parties. Okay. So third parties being insurance companies, which may be not as applicable in this country, but perhaps in the future will become far more applicable, or if you practice outside of Vermont, it's something to really keep in mind. Um, employers is another thing. They should not have access to this information, media or society. Okay. So to uphold non-maleficence, this is a statement that we can apply in terms of the genetic interpretation. So the third one, all right. So what do we understand by this one? Mm -hmm. Okay, absolutely, to uphold the good in the interest of the patient. Now, to just discuss this a little bit further, I've highlighted a, a bit of a historic case, which was um, at that stage in the US where most of the litigation suits were occurring, but now we know that happens everywhere. But at that time, um, in the 1900s, there was a case of FAP, familial adenomatous polyposis. Okay. You guys have heard of that condition before? Anyone heard about it? Okay. So it's, for those of you that haven't, it's a inherited colorectal cancer syndrome. It's inherited in a dominant manner and it causes hundreds to thousands of adenomatous polyps to develop in the colon. And if you don't remove the colon, these individuals will develop a malignancy. Okay. So keeping that in mind, this gentleman that passed away, he had FAP and he begged his doctor not to inform his family about it. Okay. So the doctor respected his wishes, he upheld his patient's autonomous decision and confidentiality. Okay, which is one of the principles we've been talking about, right? Mm -hmm. But the daughter decided when she was a little bit older to go and look further into the cause of her father's death and she obtained the pathology reports and she found out that he had FAP. And she also knew that FAP was dominant, mm -hmm. which meant that she was at a... What percentage? 50% 50 50 risk of herself being affected with FAP, which is a life-threatening disorder, okay? So she then sued the doctor for not informing her about this risk, and she actually won the case because she was never aware that she was at risk. But the doctor followed the principles. Exactly, so he's following some of our ethical principles, but what are we also talking about beneficence? What does that mean? Beneficence means do no harm. Okay. So by respecting the autonomous decision and confidentiality, is he doing harm? Yeah, not to the uh, Okay, is he doing harm to his patient? No. No. Is he doing harm to the family? Yes. Yes. yes, yes because they need early detection. Exactly, and she needs to consider colectomy. Yes. Exactly, exactly. So basically, just to summarize this, yeah. in the end, she won the case, okay? And the doctor was sued for not upholding the ethical principles. Mm -hmm. But you're right. How do we balance all of those very important, we've discussed three out of the four already, how do we balance those together? principles protecting us this is what you need to know, and we'll discuss how you go about it to make sure that you protect yourself legally. Okay. All right. So in this situation, he was wrong, okay, based on the court's decision. 
So if we look into that a little bit more detail on how we go about protecting ourselves as medical professionals, and again I want to emphasise that this is where genetic information may be a lot more different to our usual um, understanding of medical ethics in our routine or day-to-day -day activities. Okay. So often we're faced with this conflict of how to go about preserving confidentiality or autonomous decision while still being able to inform family about a very significant risk. Okay, and we know in genetics, one of the important factors to always recognize is that that information does not only apply to the individual, it applies to the whole family. Okay? So in rare cases, we can go and disclose this information against our patient's wishes. And for that to happen, there are a number of criteria that needs to be fulfilled. The first of which is, um, we need to first of, first of all, we need to look at the condition for which we are going to divulge that information on. Okay. Is it serious? Is there surveillance? Is there treatment? Does it have an effect on reproductive decisions? Now, if you think of our example of FAP, is this condition serious? Yes. Yes, it can lead to death. Yeah. Okay. Is there surveillance available? How would you look at look out for adenomatous polyps? By doing the colonoscopy. Absolutely. So there is surveillance available. Mm -hmm. Is there treatment? Yes. yes. Okay, colectomy. Collectomy. And how does it does it impact reproductive decisions? Yes, yes. absolutely. Know that the inheritance mm -hmm. is the exactly. So maybe the maybe she did not want to have children. Maybe she would have gone for PGD. We don't know, but there could be a possible effect on reproductive decisions. Okay. So if a condition um, is as serious as FAP, like we're using as our example, we do suggest that we break confidentiality, okay? Because of the greater purpose of the far worse outcome yes. being on the door to then the outcome of breaking that confidentiality of our patient. But there are steps to do that in a proper way. Okay, and these include, first of all, the doctor, what he should have done in that situation was to try and persuade his patient about the seriousness of this disorder and the implications on his family members. Mm -hmm. Then, as doctors, we need to not make that decision by ourselves. We go and discuss it with our colleagues. How do they feel about it? Do they share our opinion that we should break confidentiality and go and discuss this with our patient or not? And if we all agree, we can even take this to the ethical board of the institute that we're working at. Um, we need to inform our patient that we're going to breach his confidentiality and tell the family about this information. Okay, so there's a way to do this in the right way to protect ourselves. But it always comes back to looking at those ethical principles. We need to try as far as possible respect all four, but sometimes by respecting one, you're disrespecting another one, and then you need to look at the greater harm or the better good and between all those. And criteria should fit, right? Yes. All of them. Yes. Not only like uh, seriousness only. Yeah. Or yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for some conditions, it's not going to be as serious as this. Mm -hmm. Or if you don't inform, it's not going to have an effect. But using FAP as an example, we can just get a sense of when to do it. Okay. okay. But you'll hardly ever be faced with the situation. This is really something that we talking through more on a hypothetical basis. But if it had to come to this, this is what one would do. Okay. All right, the last principle, justice. Okay, what does that mean? Yes. Fairness, equality for all in terms of particularly healthcare. However, we can't always offer true justice because we know that for some patients they may be close to, you know, um, royal hospital or a polyclinic and they're probably going to get far better care or access to services if they were in the area of rural hospital than that particular polyclinic. Or if they're on a registry, they'll probably, based on their age or health related history, they may be preferred to another individual who is older or perhaps has a history of smoking and so forth. Mm -hmm. So as far as possible, we do try and uphold this principle, but at times it's not 100% fair for everyone. So those are the four principles I just want you to keep in mind when we go through these cases. And um, 
as I said, again, really these are hypothetical, but at times we do come across some of these issues. And as far as possible, we try and deal with them in an ethical manner. But at times, we also do make mistakes. But if you follow all of those guidelines, the chances of making the mistake are far less likely. But we do learn from our mistakes and for the next situation as well. OK. All right, so using uh, our first example, um, I'll read it out to you, Salem. He's a 40-year-old <laughs> man. He works as a school bus driver. He is married and has three daughters and two sons. And he's been referred to the genetic clinic because of his family history of Huntington disease. Okay. So Huntington, you're all familiar with? Yes, yes. Okay. So just to give you, make sure that we have the necessary clinical information to understand the ethics, tell me a bit about it. it what you know? Okay. Adult age of onset, typically. Yes. Progressive. Yes. Mm -hmm. Progressive. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's dominant. Uh, uh -huh. methods, Good. So. What, what type of clinical features would you expect to see? It is um, involuntary, like um, a uh, patient cannot control. Okay, so career. Mm -hmm. like this, and then until he uh, reaches to bed rest, like. uh -huh. Absolutely. So you've emphasized the progressive nature. Um, we've emphasized that there's involuntary movement or career. Um, there's intellectual disability that comes with or uh, an effect on intellectual function and there's behavioural disturbances which lead to dementia. Okay, it's the three or the triad of symptoms that typically go with this adult onset disorder. So this gentleman um, comes to us for this particular condition and we take his pedigree and we see that there's a very strong family history of HD <coughs> and his father died in his 60s. He had a number of um, aunts and uncles and some cousins who were also affected by this condition. So we know, we've mentioned it's autosomal dominant in nature, so as a result, what would his risk be? 50% 50. 50 right, independent of gender, fantastic. So now, when you see him, you notice that he is anxious, restless and he has a fine tremor and you ask him some questions about recent events for which he was unable to recall the information. He did mention that he tends to forget a lot and he's refused a physical exam. Okay, so what are you thinking at this point in time? Okay, before we before we talk about his family, mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about him. Mm -hmm. Are we worried? Are we not yes, worried? Yes, yes, okay. Worried. And why are we worried? Because we have history and we have some okay, so there's a positive family history and there's some concerning clinical findings. Mm -hmm. But what do we also need to remember? If we look at what we're seeing, are we, are we saying he definitely has HD? No. 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 no why not? Why not? Because uh, he's having Okay, but even more so, why not? What happens when you go for an appointment? Mm -hmm. What happens when you go to the doctor? Oh, yeah, or when you're anxious? Yeah, the lab, lab uh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But we have a positive family history. We do, is, uh, we do, but we can't just, he's still at a 50% risk of yeah. not yes. carrying the gene, which will cause HD. So if, even if I go to a doctor for a routine appointment, I'm what, I don't have a family history of anything that's sitting on my head and worrying me even more. My blood pressure shoots up. I may have a slight tremor. Now, can you imagine in the sitting of meeting a doctor who now knows about your family history, how you would feel? Okay. So be careful. And don't always jump to conclusions, even in light of a family history. Okay, so yes. There's reason to, for us to worry at this stage, mm -hmm. based on what we're seeing and based on his family history, <coughs> but that's not enough for us at this point in time to mm -hmm. conclusively suspect HD. Okay, all right. So um, you counseled him about this 50% risk, and you also mentioned to him that you're a little bit worried about a few signs, and perhaps it may be useful to go see a neurologist. He gets extremely angry, 
He leaves the room ref refusing any further referrals or follow-up or testing. And he tells you that, as he mentioned previously, he doesn't want anybody to know about this. He may lose his job if they find out, and that's the only source of income for his family. He's responsible for them. Okay, so we're dealing with a difficult ethical case. How, how do we list um, or how do we describe autonomy in this case? How would we ensure autonomy? This is the point, because you say he's had, he will be there. Firstly, l let's describe autonomy in this case. What is ab achieving autonomy for him? He cannot give voluntary. He cannot give yeah. yeah. so he, he yeah. yeah. So respecting his wishes yeah. to not be referred, to not have testing, to not tell anyone. Okay, good. What is confidentiality? The same, more or less the same. Okay. And what is non-maleficence in this situation? So again, what is non-maleficence? Okay. Okay. So, to not do harm to him, we should respect his wishes. But what other harm can come about knowing that genetics influences the individual as well as the family? And also consider his work. So where could the potential harms come from in this situation? No, 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 no. You mean, uh, what is the harm? Mm -hmm. In not uh, informing yeah. yes. Okay, good. Because it will affect his family and his career as well. Okay. Eventually. Who are we more worried about here? Yes. What is his job? Okay. Mm. Okay. So, HD for his family, yes, we are worried, but there's no surveillance, there's no treatment. So, it doesn't always fulfill all those criteria we were talking about in the FAP situation. But there's a greater harm as a result of his job title and work to the children. Okay. So, we're very worried about the risk that if he does have HD, he could pose while driving that could affect those children. Okay, so in this situation, again, it's not as straightforward, but there's a greater harm to not disclosing than there is the harm to his confidentiality and to not, uh, autonomous decision making. Okay, and again, that's not easy. And perhaps if we refer back to that previous example, there are those steps that we could undertake to ensure that we breach that confidentiality in the best possible way with the least amount of harm. We'll go through all of those steps and hopefully we won't be having to do it against his wishes but if we've completed all those steps and he still doesn't agree to it we would have to go override his decision and break confidentiality. Yes, we have to inform him of that. Yeah. Okay. And again, hardly ever happens. Okay, we haven't faced a situation as extreme as this but it's just I'm trying to illustrate the facts of how one goes about it, but most of the time it's not something that, that comes up to this extent. Okay. All right, so case two, um, an, another ethical dilemma. We now have a little boy who's been referred as a result of an increasing difficulty with walking. On examination he has hypertrophy, the calf muscles, positive Gower signs, and very high CK. So for those of you who are not familiar with these clinical signs, anyone want to take a guess? Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Okay. So it's the most common form of childhood muscular dystrophy, and we would particularly come across this condition very often in our, our practice. Okay. So when we take the family history, we see again that there's a, a um, strong family history of muscular dystrophy. We've now uh, confirmed that it's Duchenne muscular dystrophy and we suspect a particular diagnosis based on how this is presenting in the family and that would be only boys being affected for the most part? Yes, only boys. So what type of inheritance? X-linked. Okay. 
And we're now faced with coming to our tricky situation where because this is inherited and because it has affected one of our parents' children, Anwar specifically, they are worried about Arwa and Osama, their other children. Okay, they've heard that this is an inherited disorder and they now want to know what does this mean for my younger children. So when it comes to testing for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and we're talking particularly about um, genetic testing, not just doing CK levels, would we offer testing to which individuals in this family? Okay, so even without testing the mom, I can say she's an obligate carrier. Remember we said obligate carrier has one affected child and another first degree relative. Okay, so she has to be a carrier. All right, so, but yes. She would be someone that we could offer testing for. Who else? What about her sister? My sister? Mm. Our mother's sister? Uh, our mum's sister. Our mum's sister. sister. Will we offer testing to her? Why not? She has an unaffected son. Do we need to test her? No. She could still be a carrier <coughs> and she could just have passed on her ex without the DMD mutation. Okay. So yes, we still need to offer testing to her. And the older brother, unlikely, okay, he's old, we don't need to offer testing. We would have seen clinical symptoms, okay. Um, all right, so coming back now to our concern is, do we offer testing to the daughter and to the boy or not? Now her son, mm -hmm. he's three already, and typically, if I give you a bit of background about DMD, we, one would say that, you would usually see delayed milestones, you might see tiptoe walking, um, difficulty with running, uh, unsteady gait. And we asked the mom about all of this and she says, no, there's absolutely no concerns, he's developing well. Mm -hmm. So will we go ahead with testing? Mm -hmm. No, no need. Mm -hmm. okay. There's nothing to indicate that we need to. We can do a CK if we wanted to, but there's no need for genetic testing per se. Okay. Unless if for some reason there's extreme anxiety, we might consider it, but usual clinical practice, no. Okay. Now what about her daughter? Arwa is five. Are we worried about females in this condition? No. Typically no, although we do worry about cardiomyopathy in about 10 to 15 percent of carriers with the same uh, mutation as in the affected son. Okay, and you would have to organize for screening, but that would usually only be after the age of 16 with an echo. Do we offer genetic testing at such a young age? Is there any concerns for her at five or six or seven or eight? No. Okay. And to ensure that she gives us informed consent for her genetic testing to find out whether she's a carrier or not, would she be able to do that at five? No. No. Okay. So we cannot take it from the parents. We can test the mom, but we already know she the consent. But then we wouldn't ensure informed consent on behalf of the child. And the the pros and cons to testing for carrier status in childhood, and we'll go more into this in, in the upcoming module, but basically the um, cons outweigh the pros. There's more harm that can be done to testing for a condition that doesn't have any health implications, with genetic testing I'm talking about, not with uh, clinical testing, than there is by offering testing. And the most important of those is that we take away the right of that daughter to decide for herself whether or not she wants to know. And some people don't want to know. Okay. So if we do the test now and we know, we're going against her ability to make that choice for herself. And we're not going to do any harm by waiting a few years in terms of her management.
So we would try to convince the parents that there's no need at this stage. Sometimes for the anxiety of the mom, again, she pushes and pushes and pushes. And in that situation, we would just have a, a good discussion with her about why we feel it's not necessary. And if she still pushes, then perhaps we do it slightly. The general guideline is to wait till 18. But if she's still anxious and she pushes, perhaps we do it a little bit earlier. But we would try not to do it at the age of five. Okay. If her anxiety was related to having an affected daughter, and there are sometimes reasons why girls can be affected in X-linked disorders, then we may contact the lab and ask them to issue a report only stating if it's affected or unaffected and to not disclose the carrier status. Okay. All right. So a tricky ethical situation that I wanted to highlight here was also the fact that when we're talking about carrier testing in young individuals who are not at risk, whether that's recessive or X-linked, there's a presumption to generally wait until 18 years. Okay. However, that may change if someone's getting married earlier than 18 or is at risk of starting a family earlier than that change and obviously we need to consider doing this earlier. Okay. We'll go into more details in the upcoming lectures about that. So then to finish off on case three, um, this individual will take back to the prenatal setting. We've got Miriam and Said who've been referred because they are at risk of um, having a child with metachromatic leukodystrophy. So this is one of the lysosomal storage disorders. It's neurodegenerative. Children are born absolutely normal, but they then go on to lose uh, intellectual disability. Uh, they go on to develop motor um, skills and loss of that. They have hearing problems, vision problems. It ends up them being bedridden. They lose all skills that they would have acquired um, within the childhood period. Okay, so it's a horrible condition to have. And there's um, the family history which indicates that they have uh, two affected children with this condition. Sorry, three affected, one of whom has already passed away. And they're now currently pregnant. And you can just imagine the concern that they have for this pregnancy. It's happened three times already that that 25% risk because it's recessive in nature and they're extremely anxious about what this means in this pregnancy. So they want to talk to you about prenatal testing and for the purpose that if that test is positive, if this baby is affected, they want to consider talking to you about stopping the pregnancy. Okay, so what do we know a bit about the ethics around um, stopping a pregnancy here in Oman. Uh, normal issue carries harm to the mother. It depends mm -hmm. on the decision exactly. age first. And then if it is uh, carrying a harm to the mother, also this yeah. is another factor. So okay. So here there's no harm to the mum. Okay. So in Oman, it's a bit more tricky to talk about the concept of fetal indications rather than maternal indications. But in this situation, there's a risk for the fetus, 25%. If we've confirmed the genetic test on any of those three affected, we have the no mutation, we are able to offer prenatal testing with chorionic villi sampling or amniocentesis. And we can talk to her about stopping a pregnancy or termination if she chooses to follow a fatwa that does allow that. And there is an existing fatwa that does allow for termination of pregnancy up until the 120 day period or the ensalment period, if certain criteria are met, okay, seriousness of the disorder, no treatment, etc., based on the decision of both mom and dad. However, uh, and I'll talk about salting boost specifically, um, at our hospital we don't facilitate the service of stopping a pregnancy, we only facilitate the service of testing. So those parents who follow that fatwa who want to stop a pregnancy have the opportunity to unfortunately leave the country and access a service where they can undergo that. But it is based on their uh, perception of the fact we're religiously allowed and legally allowed for them. The ethical dilemma comes here, making that choice okay, for the parents. And again, we'll go into far more details of this in upcoming lectures, but also um, coming back to their daughter, whether or not they would offer testing for her for carrier status. So now we're dealing with a recessive disorder. All right. She is 
unaffected. Based on this pedigree and the family history, you can see that this condition presents early. All right. It's, if she's 10 and she hasn't got any symptoms, regression, she's unaffected. Okay. So would we offer testing for her? This age? No. 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 Again, the same as last time. Okay. We wouldn't offer because she's not at risk of being affected. Okay. And we'd prefer to wait until she was older so that she can make an informed choice and decide for herself whether or not she wanted to know if she was a carrier. Okay. All right. So I hope that by discussing these examples, you've looked back at those principles. Mm -hmm and seeing how they're slightly different as we apply them to genetics. But if we always look at them and see which is the greater harm, which is the greater good, we can, for the most part, come up with the right decision for our patients. Okay. All right, so I'll leave it there. So I know then you can pick up on the other issues. Is that fine? I hope I've not gone too much over my time. Any questions? Or should we leave that for the end so that I don't keep you anymore, perhaps?